So Alex, perhaps you would like to show us a little bit about cargo. Oh, Alex, take it away. Okay. So this is my game. It's called uh, Cargo, which is a, it's a, an adventure game about a snail who's um, lost his shell, or her shell, and she's trying to get back. Um, now, the reason I did that little switch there was because um, I thought it would actually be better to have a, um, a female protagonist, but uh, anyway, snails are hermaphrodites, so we can go either way. Um, now, this is the menu screen. Um, you can see it's a blender scene. Um, we've got some objects here behind the menu, and um, when I start the game, you'll see the snail come out of that shell. Um, the is on. Okay. Now it may be a little bit strange because I'm running it inside a inside a Blender window. Normally it runs as a standalone thing. Okay, so we'll start the game. And it's a shame you can't hear the music because uh, there was some fantastic tunes made by a friend of mine called Robert Lee. Uh, if you want to go and play the game, um, this is where you can download it from: cargo.smithsoftware.com. Without further ado, let's play. So, uh, we can aim. Uh, we uh, M D S or Melbourne Blender Society. And uh, loading the game takes a little while. And with the Blender game engine, there's no way to uh, there's no way to show loading progress. So I needed to give the user something to do while while the loading is going on, so we just update all this information. Um, when you first start the game, you get this sort of screen that shows you all the controls that you can use. So um, movement, WSAD. Um, camera, you can use the mouse. Switching shells and activating and dropping shells. Uh, and um, yeah, I'll get going. Uh, well, I've had a report that they can hear the music. So <laughs> oh, you, you can hear this music. Yep. Yes, so we've gone uh, IRC, you can hear the music, so okay. hopefully it won't do horrible things with feedback, so we'll let it go and see how we go. Oh dear, <laughs> this could be a disaster. Uh, what, what, what do they say, is it, is it terrible? Uh, no, so far, yep, uh, yep. Uh, from uh, Qual over in, I think he's uh, over in Perth, hi Qual. Um, so let us know if it starts feeding back, but we'll keep going. Yeah, and uh, let us know if you can't hear me speak as well. Over to to us, it actually sounds really quiet. So anyway, um, oh, and Andrew, yep. since I haven't prepared a demonstration, um, feel free to ask any questions as I play the game, okay. <laughs> if anything's not obvious. So uh, yep, game starts. Uh, so there's dialogue. Um, this sort of story interaction um, was uh, quite difficult to do. It took a lot of development time, because what I needed to do was build a sort of state machine for the story to progress through. So um, there are several states, and at each point, uh, it waits for the user in input. So I press return and it goes on to the next statement. Sometimes there are choices. And it also, um, this state machine also triggers the animation, and sound effects, and camera switches, and all of that sort of thing. So we can say, oh, I'm too sleepy, I don't want to do it. Mm. Uh, in this case, it's a bit of a false choice because the worm's not going to let you get away with it that easy. Mm -mm. And so it begins. So, you're a post mail, we need to deliver some mail. One of the things I had a lot of fun doing was making this nail sort of wrap around objects that you crawl over. Really, sort of a tight integration with the world that you're in. And you can crawl through the grass as you do so, it brushes out of the way. This is something else that took a long time to make because. Uh, there are lots of blades of grass in the level, as you can see. And, uh, and these big leaves up here, they move too. And uh, you can't have them all active at once. They're all rigged. They've got a, each one of them has a skeleton. But if they were all active at once, it would really slow the, slow the game down. So uh, there's a sort of acceleration structure behind the KD tree that chooses which pieces of grass you're close to and just activates those. 
these flowers are arranged as rows around the island. So, the so hitting the flowers, do they do anything for you? Right. Uh, the, uh, the little blue balls of nectar that drop from them, they make you go faster. And here we are at the lighthouse. So we'll say we've got some mail for you. Did it take you to actually develop this because this looks like a huge amount of work it took quite a while um, I was working on it for about five and a half years and um, and and then it's sort of dragged on even longer than that because um, you know I'd, I'd done all that work and, and got the game finished and then uh, I tried to publish it and I found that there were some bugs on other platforms so I was I developed it all on Linux, and when I tried to play it on Windows, um, you can see uh, if you look carefully, the no, no, <laughs> maybe it's broken on Windows too. <laughs> yeah, currently broken. Uh, something else, right? But uh, <laughs> uh, what was happening was um, so the, the leaves of the tree is, and and the grass all sort of blow in the wind, and they, they move around. And they're not doing it now, right. but uh, so so it was actually doing that, but they were sort of splitting apart, and you could see the individual polygons, right? And that was a difference in, in drivers. Like even with the same video card, just the, the difference between running it on Windows and Linux um, just meant that yeah, that wasn't working. So I had to sort of redesign the shader that was doing that um, that wind. And uh, yeah, so publishing for multiple platforms is Quite a drag. Um, it took much longer than I wanted it to, and it's annoying because it's it's after you've done all the fun stuff and, and you've made all the um, the animations and the dialogue and the music and everything, and you sort of you just want to get it out there and you can't. So. <laughs> But I had a lot of fun with it, um, but I certainly learned a lot. Did you do the music yourself? Uh, no, so yeah, the music is done by a friend of mine, Robert Lee, and um, he makes music as well. And the, the voices were done just by friends. But I think this one was a friend of mine called Ben. And I had another Ben who um, helped record other sound effects, like you can hear the when the ant steps is speaking to make the sound noises on the ground. And that one when he hits the wood. I've got a comment here from Genome 36. It says the snail has some fantastic animations. So, so this is a the actual snail is completely rigged for to be interactive, isn't it? Yeah. So um, thanks, Gino. That's, that's nice. Um, actually, the, the snail has the least sort of pre-canned animation. It's mostly um, programmatic. So there's a lot of Python scripts behind this, and um, and so there's there's a rig in the snail, and when when the snail crawls over a rock or over a sharp surface, it sort of bends around it. And then about the only animation that the snail actually has is um, 
the, the tail movement. See how the tail sort of extends and contracts. That's that's really about it. Oh, and and this animation for going inside the shell. Um, but yeah, everything else is just programmatic. So scripts are updating this now, and, and uh, you see if I can get in the right spot, the um, the eyes are sensitive. If I if I bump into this plant here, the eye will retract and then slowly come out again. Yeah, so lots lots of scripting, um, but a huge amount of content creation too. I didn't expect it. I thought I thought most of the time would be spent programming, but actually making all the models and um, and yes, animating and, and all the textures took a long time. And uh, I definitely had a, a problem with feature creep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I originally thought the game would only take six months to make. And yeah, it ended up taking I guess six years. And uh, it's funny every time somebody asked me how long how long have you got left on this game, and every time I said yeah six months, it's definitely going to be six months from now. And I honestly thought that I, I even like wrote down a list of everything that I could think of that I had to do and I put a time next to it. How long is it going to take? And every time I thought it would take six months. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's it's uh, you know it's a problem when. I didn't have any real deadlines, and I was doing this for fun as much as anything else. So um, every so often, I think, oh, you know, it'd be really cool if, if the grass moved when you, when you rush past it. Um, it would be really cool if I had um, this extra character. Although I was, I was pretty careful not to add too many um, characters because they take the longest. Mm -hmm. I think the longest thing of any of the content to make was uh, the the non-player characters that you meet and, um, and have conversations with because those animations just took forever. How, how are you actually storing? Because there's obviously a, a, a game flow as such that I imagine branches depending on what you actually do in there. So how do you actually store that? Is that, a, is that all just stored in Python? Or a series of like Python scripts? Or have you got some other way of doing it? So sort of like the saved game? No, as in like you know, the you. I'm assuming that the game is not totally linear. That you can go, you can basically you can go to the source bar, or you can go to the end, or you can go to something else. So how do you store all the different, like the the scripting of the flow of the game as such? If that makes sense. Um, yeah. So you have these scripts that uh, just respond to. What you're doing in the game, so so yeah, you could you can go anywhere on the island and, and, and do things in any order to some extent, but um, there are triggers that you need to um, there are sort of things you need to do before you can progress into certain sections, and that's done using uh, Blender's save game functionality, which is available through Logic Games, but also through Python. So I would uh, mostly do it through Python. And so, for example, when I come into the source bar, it, it remembers where I am, um, and it remembers that I've dropped my shell. Um, and if I talk to the to the barman, so you see, I can I can offer the barman a, a, a letter, and this has come from the lighthouse keeper that we spoke to earlier. And so that was just a, a I guess a, a flag in the uh, the blender save game API. So what I did is I said, I've got a, a bit of text, which is a description of the piece of information I'm trying to save. And in this case, it would be something like a um, letter from Lighthouse Keeper. And or like have, have letter from Lighthouse Keeper and just say true. And so when I get to this point, um, it would say, has, do you have the letter? And, and if so, then, then offer this part of the conversation. And if not, then um, the, the Lighthouse the, um, say something else. Uh, Qualism has uh, commented that tomato sauce costs, it looks like it costs 13 bucks. So that's, uh, he's saying that must be a waste of dry <laughs> hand, but, uh. Yeah, it's vintage tomato sauce though. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, and do you know, I'm actually asked, is it possible to see the armature of the snail? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So maybe I should stop playing it and uh, let you lovely viewers play it later. Um, 
first of all, before I do though, this I, I just like to say I didn't make the whole game. Um, I, I worked on it for a long time by myself, but I also had help from a lot of people. Um, the, the guy who did the music, who I've already mentioned, and um, many others. Um, you can see the credits on the site, but I'll, I'll just say this bar in particular was made by um, a friend of mine called Junki Iwano, who um, who's from Japan, um, and I think he did a really fantastic job. He did quite a few of the other textures in the game as well. I'll just show you what happens when you come out here, just to entice you. Oh no, disaster. All right, let's go out and have a look at some rigs. Um, we says we've got five minutes here, but I'm not sure. Uh, I'll have to check the website and see if anybody's scheduled after us because we, we might just accidentally run over if we're not going to cut into somebody else's time. Okay, well, we can't not to, though. Yes, so I'll just check. So this is the scale. So the snail lives in its own file, and um, there's nothing in here except the snail and, and a few sort of um, test levels for me to, to play around with. Um, this one was the one that I tested on most because uh, it's you know it's a complex shape, and um, I wanted to be able to test the snail in all sorts of odd situations. So on the first layer, we've got the snail mesh and the rig. So there's the rig. Just hide the snail. That's the, the snail rig. It's pretty basic. How many bones? 20, 24 bones in this snail. And you can do things like, um, if I grab this bone and the, uh, the front of the snail oops, rotates. And um, a, few, a few of these bones are just here for, um, for the, the scripts to use. So like there are two bones here which rotate apparently the same part of the snail. And the reason for that is that one of them is a reference bone. And that's used by these things here. So these are sort of um, sensors that it's, it's like a, if anybody's used the game engine, it's like a ray sensor where you cast a ray at a surface and, and see if it hits anything. These ones will actually cast a ray in a circle and see if they can detect anything. And the reason for that is that when the snail is crawling, you want you want the ray to to be reaching around and see if it can hit the surface. But if you go over an edge, you want it to go around the edge and, and hit the um, hit the next surface. Like you, you might have a, a quite a obtuse angle, and you want it to go around and, and hit that next edge, so that you can see how far the snail needs to bend when it goes over that surface. Uh, here are some more sort of um, reference objects that are used by the scripts. I'm not sure what this is. Oh, this is a uh, yeah. This is just um, a couple of empties for laying down the trail as you as you crawl along the snail trail. Oh, and this is my lighting rig. So that's it for the snail. Um, okay, now we go. Two more minutes. Uh, well, I'm looking at the um, the session schedule, uh, and it looks like uh, there is a, a six-hour break at this stage. Six hours. Yeah, that's the problem about being on the opposite side of the world to Europe and the US. It's 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 the middle of the night in Los Angeles and much of um, much of the US at the moment. Yeah, um, I'm surprised that it's that long. I thought um, I understand Perth. We 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 lost Perth. So. Unfortunately, uh, so this is um this is the bird that you just had a sneak peek of at, at the end. Um, I really don't want to run into any anybody else's time. Can we go back to ISD and just make sure? Sure. So this bird is um, interesting. This is, I think, the one mesh that wasn't made for cargo. This mesh is actually taken from Yo Frankie. So. You know, uh, in, in the Yo, Yo Frankie video game, there was a bird in the credits at the start that was the title screen where it would flap over and it hit a poo and then it kept, kept going. So I took that bird because I, I quite liked the simplicity of the, the rig and um, 
it's, it's really allows a lot of expression. And, uh, and also I like the wings. I was wondering how I, how I do wings and thought I'd just take that bird. And it's a Creative Commons license and so is my game. So that was what we did. Uh, but uh, we redid the textures and, the, and we remodeled the, uh, the face a little bit as well. It's a really nice rig though. Uh, you, can, you can grab bits of it and it's all completely squash and stretch. All the bones, um, they have parents, so they can do this sort of thing. I don't think there's any IK except for the feet. So I can I can just grab the, the middle the middle of the bird and sort of stretch it right out. And the wings look really nice. Hold these out. And the feet are pretty cool too. So you just zoom in here. Uh, I can so if I scale this, then the foot opens. And I've got an empty parent to this bone as well, constrained somehow, I can't quite remember, with a, a shell attached, and you can, I think you can see it on the other foot too. So this, um, there's a, a sort of sphere under this foot, and it moves in response to the foot being scaled. And I did this so that the bird could grasp things, and I'd, I'd have an idea of where the thing was that it was grasping, and also so that I could, I could then parent something to that sphere, and uh, and then in the game, the, the bird could actually grab it. And if the bird flew away, then, uh, for instance, the shell would stay attached to the bird. Um, and it has control, like you can scale in um, two dimensions separately. Um, when you lift the foot up, you get sort of bulging around the belly. Um, what you did, maybe there's too much squashing there. Yeah, so I was quite pleased to find this perfect. Any word on how we're going? Um, I uh, just had to refresh IRC when it kicked me out. I had to come back. Uh, so let me just. Um, here's the graph that I mentioned previously. You can see inside here there's a, there's a bone, growing, an armature in there as well. So, so the grass can um, And we had a question from Qualism over in Western Australia again, which was, uh, are you self-taught with coding or did you actually study game design? Uh, so I am um, not self-taught for coding. Uh, I was. I did a little bit of coding um, before university, but then I did go to university. I studied um, IT, but in a software engineering stream. And uh, I've also um, had a little bit of formal animation training. I, I went to the Australian Film, Television and Radio School and studied animation there for three months. That was a, a short course, but it was really good. Um, three, month, three months of the time. And but apart from that, I'd, I'd been self-taught, um, and I'd been using Blender for a long time before that. I think maybe since '98 or '99. So, 15 years at least now. I'm just getting up there. Uh, but yeah, um, I love using Blender. It's really good. I, and these days in my work, I, I use Blender a fair bit for um, engineering simulations, and, uh, and also for doing promos for our. Okay, um, well, I've asked on IRC and nobody's come back with a, you're in trouble if you keep going. So, um, oh, and Paul says, thank you for answering. So, no worries. Uh, let me just check Twitter. Anything there? No, it's all pretty quiet. Uh, IRC is, uh, right. So, there's been no update from Campbell either, has there? Uh, well, there wouldn't be. Okay. Because he doesn't have a phone. Oh, that's right. He doesn't <laughs> have a mobile. Okay. If you like, you can dash out and see if you do. Yeah, let's start. But, uh, how about you see if you're there? Because you, you've got all the security passes and I don't want to get locked out. Thanks so, for looking at Cargo. Um, by the way, oh, um, yeah, show us yeah. this website. Yeah, on. Um, please. Oh, where's the plug? Uh, I have an already. You should have. 
start another one. Okay, so if you go to cargo.smidgensoftware.com, you'll see a site like this. And you can also find videos on YouTube if you want to review the gameplay. Um, so you can you can download it from the site. There's a pay what you want to download. Um, any amount is fine. And there's a little bit of information about how it was made. Uh, and yeah, the, the, the game is completely open source and free. So there's uh, so it's, the code is all licensed under the GPL, and the assets are all Creative Commons um, and it's DRM free. So yeah, go nuts. Um, download it. Share it with your friends, modify it, and I'd love to hear if you make anything from it or if, if you just enjoy playing it. <laughs>